The universal suction specific speed, is a unitless parameter that identifies the suction characteristics of the pump. It has the same form as the pump specific speed, but with two different parameters. It is equal to the pump's rotational speed in radians per second times the square root of the pump's flow rate at the best efficiency point in meters cubed per second divided by the multiplication of the gravitational acceleration in meters per second squared times the NPSHR at the best efficiency point raised to the power three quarters by substituting the units of all the terms that are in the equation we find that indeed the universal suction specific speed is a dimensionless, or unitless parameter. Note that for double suction impellers, the flow rate in the universal suction specific speed equation, should be set to half the value of the overall pump flow rate. For centrifugal pumps, the universal suction specific speed can be between 1.1 and 7.3, depending on the pump design. The Hydraulic Institute ANSI, slash HI 2000 pump standards, recommends a value of 3.1 for the universal suction specific speed. Above a value of around 3.5, the rate of pump failures that are attributed to suction problems increases significantly. The suction specific speed is a dimensional parameter that is often used instead of the universal suction specific speed. Since it is dimensional, unlike the universal suction specific speed, the value of the suction specific speed depends on the units that are used. It is equal to the shaft's rotational speed in RPM or rotations per minute times the square root of the pump's flow rate at the best efficiency point divided by the NPSHR at the best efficiency point raised to the power three quarters. In English units the pump's flow rate at BEP is expressed in gallons per minute. And the NPSHR at BEP is expressed in feet. In this case the suction specific speed is equal to 2733.016 times the universal suction specific speed. For centrifugal pumps the suction specific speed can be between 3000 and 20000, depending on the pump design. The Hydraulic Institute ANSI slash HI 2000 pump standards, recommends a value of 8500 for the suction specific speed. Above a value of around 9500, the rate of pump failures that are attributed to suction problems increases significantly. Find the recommended value of the NPSHA, at the best efficiency point, according to the Hydraulic Institute, for a pump that is running at a speed of 2000 rpm with a flow rate of 1000 gallons per minute the NPSH margin for this pump should be set at 1.5 when you are finished press the play button to check your answer based on the recommendations of the hydraulic institute in the ANSI slash HI 2000 pump standards the suction specific speed should be set to 8500. The values of the suction specific speed, the pump speed, and the flow rate are plugged in the equation for the English unit's suction specific speed. The equation is then solved for the NPSHR at the best efficiency point. A value of 14.53 feet is obtained. Finally the NPSHA at the best efficiency point is obtained. As the multiplication of the NPSH margin and the NPSHR at the best efficiency point, a value of 21.79 feet is obtained. Gas entrainment occurs when a gas is mixed with the liquid. The entrained gas can take three forms. The first form is bubbles. Gas filled bubbles are almost spherical in shape and have a maximum diameter of about 1 cm. When bubbles grow larger than that size, they either break up into smaller bubbles, or they cease to have a nearly spherical shape. The reason why bubbles are spherical is due to the surface tension of the liquid. The second form of gas entrainment is gas pockets. Gas pockets are larger than bubbles. Due to the relatively large size of the gas pockets, the surface tension force is too small to counter other forces acting on the gas pocket from the fluid 
such as momentum and pressure forces. Hence gas pockets are not spherical and they can take any arbitrary shape. The third form of gas entrainment is dissolved gas. According to Henry's law, when a gas at a certain pressure is present above the liquid, some of this gas will dissolve into the liquid. When the gas pressure is reduced, some of that gas goes out of solution and forms bubbles. It should be noted that gas bubbles and gas pockets do not contain only gas. They also contain liquid vapor, at the ambient liquid vapor pressure. Also note that the gas volume fraction of gas pockets and bubbles must be calculated using a sufficiently large flow volume in order to obtain an accurate value. Finally, the liquid volume fraction is equal to 1 if the flow contains only dissolved gas and no gas bubbles or pockets. There are many piping system flaws that can cause gas to be entrained with the liquid into the system's pump. The most common are 1. Improper design of the suction piping 2. Sloshing, which causes gas to mix with the liquid being pumped 3. Air leaks into pipes that are under sub-atmospheric pressures If the suction piping is improperly designed, a gas funnel can form at the point where the suction pipe draws liquid from a tank. If the funnel extends to within the suction pipe, then gas can be entrained with the liquid. This problem can be eliminated by putting the suction pipe deeper within the tank. Or by reducing the flow rate to the pipe. Sloshing occurs when the surface of a liquid tank is highly perturbed. This causes pockets of gas to be engulfed within the liquid as it sloshes. These gas pockets can then be sucked into the intake pipe. This problem occurs most often in the hydraulic tanks of earth moving equipment. It can also occur on tanker ships if liquid is pumped from the ship's tanks under rough sea conditions. Another situation where this can occur is when the surface of the tank from which the liquid is being drawn is highly perturbed. This can be due to surface waves or to the effect of another pipe discharging into that tank. This problem can be resolved by optimizing the tank's support structure in order to minimize the vibrations of the tank. Baffles can also be added within the tank to dampen the movement of the liquid. The situation where the discharge from another pipe is too close to the suction pipe's intake should also be avoided. Finally, since air is lighter than the liquid and would hence tend to rise to the surface after being mixed with the liquid, Increasing the depth of the suction pipe should reduce the amount of air bubbles that enter into the suction pipe. A hole on a pipe that is under sub-atmospheric pressure, will cause air to be sucked into the liquid that is flowing inside the pipe. To prevent this problem, the piping system must be free of leaks. Furthermore, preferably, the pressure within all sections of the system should be higher than atmospheric. Hence the pipe system designer should avoid raising the elevation of any section of the piping system unnecessarily. This is due to the fact that according to Bernoulli's equation, keeping the velocity constant, as the height of the pipe increases, the pressure within the pipe is reduced. Gas entrainment can have many adverse effects on pumps and the piping systems in which they operate. Even at low volume fractions, Gas entrainment can cause a noticeable decrease in the pump's performance, which is manifested as a loss in the pump's pressure output. Gas entrainment can also cause shock loading on the pump which can lead to pump damage. Finally gas entrainment can be the source of gas cavitation damage of the pump or of other components of the piping system. When gas bubbles or pockets of gas enter into a centrifugal pump, they cause a loss in the pressure output of the pump. Typically, centrifugal pumps can handle a gas volume fraction of 3 to 7 percent. Beyond 10 percent in gas volume fraction, most centrifugal pumps lose all pumping pressure due to the fact that the column of liquid flowing into the pump is broken. The graph shown here illustrates the typical effect that gas entrainment has on a centrifugal pump. The x-axis has the percent gas fraction of the flow. The y-axis has the actual pressure difference generated by the pump. Divided by the pressure difference generated by the pump under the same conditions but while operating with a zero gas fraction. As can be seen from the graph, at gas fractions below 3%, the 
the presence of the entrained gas has a negligible effect on the pump's performance. On the other hand for gas fractions that are higher than about 10. The pressure difference generated by the pump is zero which means that the pump is running dry. When pockets of gas are ingested into the pump, they change the pressure within the pump's flow passages that they are in. This causes an imbalance in the pressure that is acting on the impeller. Furthermore, since the gas is much lighter than the liquid, when a gas pocket is ingested into the pump, the impeller speeds up since it is much easier for the impeller to move within the gas as compared to the liquid. However when the liquid flow is re-established, the speed is suddenly reduced. The force and speed fluctuations cause a high level of shock loading on various pump components such as the pump's shaft, impeller, bearings, and seals. When dissolved gas enters a low pressure area of the pump, if the pressure in the liquid drops below the sum of the liquid's vapor pressure and the saturation pressure of the gas, then cavitation bubbles start to form. As discussed before, the saturation pressure of the gas is obtained from Henry's law, while the liquid's vapor pressure can be obtained from Antoine's equation. When the pressure increases again within the pump's casing, these bubbles can then collapse and cause cavitation damage. Alternatively, when gas bubbles are ingested into the pump, these bubbles can be dissolved into the liquid at the high pressure end of the pump. Downstream of the pump, when the pressure is reduced enough, the gas can then go out of solution and form cavitation bubbles that can cause cavitation damage to the piping system's components that are downstream of the pump. Just like we have a net positive suction head for the vapor, we can also calculate the NPSH for the vapor and the dissolved gaseous species. As the total inlet pressure head, minus the summation of the vapor pressure head and the gas pressure head, minus the height of the pump. Similarly to the vapor's NPSH. In metric units, the NPSH for the vapor and gas has units of meters. While in English units it has units of feet. A slurry is a mixture of a liquid with solid particles. There are three types of slurry flow regimes. In the equivalent fluid regime, the solid particles are thoroughly mixed with the liquid and do not settle on the bottom of the pipe. This regime prevails when the particle size and density are small, and the liquid velocity and turbulence are high. In this case the slurry can usually be treated as a fluid having almost the same viscosity as the liquid and an equivalent density based on the density of the liquid-solid mixture. In the partially stratified regime, some of the solid particles settle at the bottom of the pipe, while some remain suspended within the liquid. This occurs when the particle size and density are medium, and the liquid velocity and turbulence are moderate. In the fully stratified regime, Almost all of the solid particles settle to the bottom of the pipe, and almost no mixing occurs between the solid and the liquid. This occurs when the particle size and density are large, and the liquid velocity and turbulence are low. Pumps designed to handle slurry flows have some unique characteristics. In order to minimize wear on the various pump components, they operate at low universal specific speeds in the range between 0.27 and 0.73. They are constructed more heavily than regular water pumps. The thickness of the impeller's vanes and shrouds tends to be two to three times the thickness for a comparable water pump. They also use more wear-resistant material in their construction. In order to prevent blockage, and reduce wear, 
they have fewer vanes per impeller than a comparable water pump. They use a more slurry-tolerant casing design such as the C, A, or OB designs that are discussed in the volute design section. Pumping slurries have adverse effects on centrifugal pumps. The impact of the solid slurry particles against the various pump components causes erosion wear. The wear rate increases with the following. The particle size. Particle density. And hardness of the solid particles. And the square of the relative velocity between the particles and the pump's moving components. Due to the increase in wear, with the square of the relative particle pump component velocity, centrifugal pumps that are used for slurry flows are operated at lower speeds than similar pumps used for non-slurry applications. Centrifugal pumps used for slurry flows have a lower efficiency than similarly sized pumps that are used with liquids that have no solid particles. This is due to the fact that for slurry applications, the pump vanes need to be thicker and fewer than regular pumps.